This year is our fifth anniversary. Uh, we're going to be celebrating it tonight, but we're also celebrating it and marking it this afternoon with a lecture from probably the most perfect person to be speaking on behalf of public service as a career and as a life. Um, with over 20 years of experience in the federal government, uh, John Barry is a passionate and aggressive advocate for public service and for uh, federal workers. He is the director of the Office of Personnel Management, so he's the head of HR for the entire U.S. government, um, and describes himself as the federal government's chief people person. He's, he's therefore responsible for recruiting, hiring, and setting benefits policies for the 1.9 million federal civilian employees that we have throughout this country in every agency in the government. His goal is to reinvigorate the federal workforce to meet the challenges of the 21st century, or as, the pre as President Obama has charged him, to make government cool again. Uh, and to build a workforce more seriously that of dynamic innovators who will put the American people and their interests at the heart of everything they do. He began his career as a legislative director for Congressman Steny Hoyer, whose Maryland district is the home to many federal employees. It may be the highest concentration of federal employees in any congressional district. Um, during the Clinton administration, he was Deputy Assistant Secretary and Acting Assistant Secretary for Law Enforcement at the Department of Treasury, where he had direct line authority over 40% of the federal law enforcement community, including the Secret Service, which is charged with protecting the President. He also served as Assistant Secretary for Policy, Management, and Budget at the Department of the Interior. And prior to joining President Obama's administration, this part I think is particularly fun, pursued his interest as, in conservation as director of the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, and then had what I think is probably the coolest job in the world, and I want to know how to get it, is director of the National Zoo. And I can't think of a better preparation for running the entire U.S. federal <laughs> workforce either. Um, and he also has, I think, collected a number of honors in his life, and probably the greatest one is that there is a lion cub named John the Lion at the zoo. So I, with great pleasure and honor, I present John Barry, Director of the Office of Personnel Management. Barbara. Barbara, thank you for that very kind introduction. Uh, I, I gotta tell you, that lion is growing up so fast, he's gonna want the keys soon, uh, you know. He's learning how to drive. Um, but it's, uh, it's been great, and uh, it, it's even uh, wonderful to be here with you today, and I appreciate you all coming out at, towards the end of a day, at the end of a week, especially in the rain, uh, to talk about a few topics, and hopefully we'll have time at the end for some Q&A and, and be able to get into some topics that you would like as well. Um, you know, I am so uh, happy to be here tonight also speaking with the, uh, the public service program. Uh, and we'll be talking about that at the dinner. But as I go around the colleges and universities around the country, uh, I can't help but notice that young people, especially in this generation, are extremely eager to help one another and to help make our country and our world just a little bit better. So I would encourage you to take that impulse to change the world for the better and think about federal service as just one venue where you can make a very big difference. And don't for a second think it won't also be a lot of fun as well. Our global scope also brings me to another reason to think of federal service, and that is the scale of the impact that you can have working with the federal government. If you want to have the broadest reach and do the good for the most people, the federal government is a great place. The scale of your impact with us will be larger than anywhere else that you could go. Let me just give you a few examples of uh, just how in my experience I've encountered this. As Barbara mentioned, the President's health insurance reform law is a great example of that scale and impact that you can make. 
For young people in the room today, many of you here now are allowed to stay on health care plans until you're up to age 26. And that's been a great help. I know that this has been implemented around the country because just in our federal plan, for federal employees health plans, a quarter million young people just in our federal family have taken advantage of this new benefit. The Affordable Care Act also called on OPM to set up a program to cover Americans who could not get insurance on the open market because they had a pre-existing condition. They either had cancer or some other serious illness that prevented them from getting health care. And there's a significant number of people. Well, states had the option to design their own plans, but for states that decided not to, OPM was charged with setting up a plan that could service people in those states. Well, it turned out 24 states in the District of Columbia uh, did not set up a plan. And so we were given 60 days to set up an insurance program for 24 states and the District of Columbia. We did it, and we did it with an overhead rate of 0.08%. And there are thousands of people in those states today, let me tell you, who are much greatly relieved that they have insurance now when they couldn't find it before. This year, because of that law, we're also going to be adding over a million Native Americans to our health benefits program. It's going to make a huge difference in Indian country, around the country, and expand health care in many of our rural communities. Most, many of our poorest counties in the country are actually on Indian reservations. This is going to be a direct assistance in those communities. And in 2014, uh, we will have uh, another unique challenge that we're gearing up to handle, and that is uh, the multi-state exchanges we will be providing uh, the multi-state exchange for the nation's choice so that people will have not only their state option to pick from but a national plan uh, that they can choose from. And OPM will be managing that program uh, for folks around the country. Now just last week we announced our rate for the, the employees that we cover. When you think of our employees and our retirees and their dependents, it's between eight and nine million people. So it's not an insignificant sum of people that were already uh, responsible for managing. The rate increase for our most popular plan this year was 1.6 percent. And overall, the overall rate increase was significantly below the private sector rate increase that other large employers experienced. It wasn't by accident. It took a lot of work of people who were dedicated to helping and knowing that every percent increase was more money out of these people's pockets. At a time when we had frozen their pay, it was critical that we do everything we could to control the costs. And so our folks drove that number as hard as they could, and I couldn't have been happier with the result that they produced. One of my leaders in our healthcare work team is a young man named John Farmer, and he's about the age of a number of you in the room. It's an example of the responsibility and the impact uh, isn't just age related in the federal family. Uh, John has been front and center at every one of those issues that I just talked about over the past year and a half. Uh, and he's been in the White House working with the President's team on these multi-state exchanges as we gear up for 2014. Now, we've also looked at some of the other places that are broken. Uh, Barbara mentioned uh, uh, that, uh, uh, you know, the, the hiring program in the federal government is one that was a real embarrassment. And uh, we still have a long way to go, uh, but uh, we have made some significant improvements. We have finally, you would not think this is such a big accomplishment, but people have been trying to do it for 50 years. We are finally on to the world of the resume. So rather than having to write knowledge, skill, and ability essay questions, uh, which were so complicated and arduous just to be considered for employment, uh, we threw that out and have moved on to the world of the resume. We've designed fast-track programs to help people with veterans who are returning from service or facing one of the highest unemployment rates in the country. Uh, people with disability who have wonderful talents and are often shut out of the workplace, we want to make sure that they know they're welcome in the federal family. I just got my stats at OPM. We'd set a goal of 10% of our new hires 
uh, to be people with disability. We produced almost 12%. So you can see there's a lot of opportunity. If you know people th that might be shut out someplace, someplace they ought to think about is the federal system and the federal family. We don't have a position we can waste. We want the best people. And so we've been reaching out. And one of the reasons we're here today is to reach out to you. Uh, the president has been instituted uh, he looked at the plan of how we uh, asked students to come into the government and said, John, this is just crazy. It's confusing. You, you know, the president looked at me and says, what is a step and what is a skip and how do you know the difference? Well, you know, he's a pretty smart guy. <laughs> and if he can't figure it out, you know, it was a morass of weeds that, uh, you know, was facing many of our people who were uh, next generation trying to get involved in the government. So what we did is we've cut it down, and we've created three clean pathways and named them such that it's hard to make an acronym out of it. I'm sure someone in Washington will figure out how to do it. But if you're still in school, no matter what grade you're in or where you are, if you're in school, we welcome you into the federal family while you're on break, in the summer, uh, on an internship. You're an intern, and we want you to come in. And the hours that you earn, if you do a good job, after you hit a certain number, you can be converted into a permanent federal job. The other way you can come in the federal family is a recent grads program. Now, most federal jobs you need to compete for. And what was a problem, why young folks couldn't compete as effectively, or recent grads, I should say, because many of our recent grads aren't necessarily young, they're of all ages. And we want all ages in our federal government. And, but they didn't have the experience on their resume to effectively compete in an open competitive process. So what we're doing is we're gonna give you two years after you get your degree. You'll be called a recent grad. You can apply for any job for which you are reasonably qualified. You don't have to match the job with your degree like we used to have to in the old days. And you'll have a two year window. If you can get hired into a job, again, do a good job. And if you do, at the end of it, you can be converted into the permanent civil service. So two very clear pathways. In school, intern. Out of school, you're a recent grad. And you get a, this two-year window after any degree. So whether it be an associate's degree, an undergrad degree, a graduate degree, um, or a PhD, uh, what we're proposing is you get that two-year window. And then the last way we've refreshed is the Presidential Management Fellows Program. It's something I hope you all will think about. Uh, we've raised the bar. We have put back the interview. We are discussing about throwing out the assessment. I uh, took the test myself and I had to admit I was not very impressed with it. Uh, and uh, so we're looking at dropping that, uh, you know, so, and we're open to making this better. So if you've got good ideas on it, please feed them to us. I've got a great team that's working on it. Uh, but we want to raise the bar. We want to make this a major pipeline because it's a great way to come into government. And if you're interested in becoming a junior manager, sort of a leadership track, um, where you can, you can rise through the ranks pretty quickly because you have effective training and job sharing opportunities going on uh, through the program, um, that uh, <coughs> the PMF program can be a great way to do that. And so uh, I encourage you to think about that. And, uh, and that is uh, uh, one of the programs uh, that uh, is available to you. Now, don't just think from the public policy perspective, because we need scientists. We need cybersecurity. We need linguists, uh, you know, nurses, veterinarians. <laughs> um, you know, there are so many job shortages right now that where we can't find talented people to fill these jobs <clears throat> and can't find them often to fill jobs in pretty exciting places. Uh, Alaska is not a bad place to live, let me tell you. It's pretty fun having been there, having been dog sledding. It's a cool place. Um, you know, but there's incredible opportunities and amazing opportunities to think about. And uh, uh, let me, uh, let me, find my place here and catch up. Uh, let me end with sort of one area uh, that I, uh, because I, I want you, one of the key things I hope, whether you work for the federal government or not, my strong advice to you is to urge you to follow your passion. Because if you're following your passion, you will end up doing good wherever you are, 
whether you're on Wall Street or whether you're in Washington, whether you're in state and local, or whether you're in the nonprofit world. And you know, I've talked about some issues where you can talk about impact and scale and some of the numbers. One issue of personal interest to me uh, in this being uh, LGBT History Month uh, is the diversity of our LGBT community. Now, I knew from a fairly young age that I was gay. Uh, I knew because, well, you know, my first crush was Aquaman. <laughs> My father, God bless him, was as traditional as I was gay. <laughs> and it took me to the age of 25 to finally come out to him. He didn't take it very well. And I, I learned at that time that it can be like the image a person has of you essentially dies and that you need to give that person the time and space to heal and grieve. And so it was with my dad. Many LGBT youth have similar struggles or worse. Tomorrow I'm going to be heading out to Denver to speak at the Matthew Shepard Foundation Dinner. And as many of you probably know, Matthew Shepard was brutally murdered 13 years ago simply for being gay. But out of that tragedy was born the first federal statutory protections on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity, the hate crimes law that now bears his name. Even today, 13 years later, we have a very tragic epidemic of bullying that we must overcome and we will overcome it. I said at the beginning that federal workplace gives you an opportunity to have an impact at scale. I drive policy for a federal workforce of two million. And so when I was able to help the president draft a presidential memorandum extending employment benefits to same-sex domestic partners of federal employees, imagine how many lives we touched and improved in a meaningful and tangible way. I found that in joining OPM, I would be the highest ranking openly gay man in the history of the executive branch. That paled in importance to me and in meaning to a man named Dr. Frank Kameny, who passed away just this week on Tuesday. Frank was a World War II veteran, not a pencil pusher. He told me how he would run from foxhole to foxhole with Patton's army across the battlefields of Europe, praying as he never could between foxhole. He said, because the only thing that got you from foxhole to foxhole was luck, not skill. He came back and he earned his PhD in astronomy from Harvard. And he was fired in 1957 solely for being gay. Now, Frank Kameny wasn't the type of person to give up. His persistence made it possible for countless patriotic Americans to hold security clearances and high government positions, including me. And in so doing, he showed everyone what was possible for every employer in the country. I was amazingly honored, and he honored me by attending my swearing in. And he spoke at our first LGBT Pride celebration. And when I introduced him at that celebration, I was able to formally apologize on behalf of the United States for the wrong that was done him two years before I was born. It was done by the U.S. Civil Service Commission, the predecessor to the Office of Personnel Management that I now head. Frank uh, told me with a twinkle in his eye that it brought a smile to his face uh, every time he thought about it, uh, 
that Mr. Macy, who was the head of the Civil Service Commission that fired him in 57, uh, is probably spinning in his grave uh, on the day that an openly gay man was sworn into his position. <laughs> but we also presented with Frank, and to show you how big-hearted he was, was when I asked, I extended the formal apology, Frank stood up and said, I accept. Uh, he wasn't a bitter man, he was a big-hearted man. But he fought injustice and he made a difference. Teddy Roosevelt held the job that I hold before he became president. And our highest honor is the Theodore Roosevelt Award. It is rarely given and it is given only to those who have defended the merit principles that in America you should be judged only by how well you do the job and nothing else. Frank Kemeny did that with his life. He did it with passion and persistence, and he won. And we presented him with the Theodore Roosevelt Award that day. Thanks to his courage, I have had the opportunity and the honor of my life to serve this president and to help shape policy at a very historic moment in our country. Think for a second about the, just the LGBT agenda. You all probably saw the most recent accomplishment. Less than one month ago, gay and lesbian Americans could not openly and honestly serve their nation in their armed forces. But now, at long last, don't ask, don't tell, is finally in the trash can of history. And as the president recently said, no one now has to live a lie in order to serve the country that they love. Less than two years ago, those living with AIDS or other pre-existing conditions couldn't get health insurance in the United States. Now, that access is guaranteed. One year ago, a hospital could keep us from our ill partner's side and now, because of the president's directive to hospitals receiving Medicare or Medicaid funds, gay and lesbian patients cannot be denied access to their loved ones in times of need. I especially deeply value that one. My first partner passed away after 10 years of AIDS. I wouldn't be here today because no power on earth could have kept me from his side had they tried to deny me access. No one else will have to make that choice ever again. I have been proud to work in this administration where dedicated Americans, not so different from any of you, have accomplished these very things. Think of the impact that you will get to have over the course of your career on issues that you care deeply about. If you remember nothing else, remember the line about passion. Build your career around it. Seek out interesting assignments. It will keep you wanting to get up in the morning to go to work, and it will also keep you at your best. Let me just end with one note. As an amateur historian, many people, I think, look at history today as an ever-rising line sort of culminating in the current day. I would argue instead that the trajectory of progress over the 6,000 years of recorded human history, not very long, 6,000 years is it, has been a story of peaks and valleys. <laughs> And sadly, the peaks are a lot shorter usually than the valleys. Now, we can lose perspective sometimes on where we stand on that line in history. We can get carried away with the stock market report of the day or the job unemployment numbers. But I would argue that your generation, this time, is living amidst one of the greatest peaks of that scale of history. Think about it. 
The age of Pericles and Augustus, a lifetime, less than a lifetime for each, shone such a light forward over a thousand years that people walking along in the trough saw that light and remembered what humans could do. And that was the wellspring, the birth spring for the Renaissance and the Age of Reason. Our own peak didn't come easy. It was shaped by two world wars and a Great Depression. But think, the men who walk on the moon still walk amongst us today. In less than a decade, we have cracked the human genome, created the internet. The phone that you have in your pocket has access to more information than the ancient library in Alexandria. The whole thing. Now, and one argues in history that Gutenberg's printing press and the Bible created and launched the Age of Reason by providing access to information. What is that cell phone? We are at the dawn of an age of information. We don't even know where it's going to go yet. But it is sure as heck bigger than the printing press. I would argue we're living at one of the highest peaks. And the best news is for you, it ain't over yet. And the challenge to you is in finding your passion, get in the game, and help build that lighthouse higher and make its light bright. Because don't kid yourself, there'll be another trough. And we don't know how long and how bleak it might be. So the light that we build today, that your generation will build, might mean the same importance a millennium hence that Augustus and Pericles gave to the Renaissance. Let me close with one last thought. In Athens, before you were allowed to vote, you used to have to take an oath. And I often wonder if we ought not do the same today. You had to swear that everything you would do would be towards one end. And it is an end that is, I would argue, is the root of all ethics. And it is the ethics that should drive public policy. That you, we will work not only to give our country, they used to say city, our country, our world, to the next generation, not only not less, but indeed better, richer, more abundant than it was given to us. You've been given a plateau. Take it farther. God bless you and God bless the United States. Thank you. said that he is willing to take questions and I would ask you to come down to the mic and identify yourself. And I, not to be rude, I'm going to take this off. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. We can't figure out if it's 78 degrees outside or Woo. 45 degrees outside. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so my name is Larry Handerhan and I'm a graduate student at the Woodrow Wilson School and I want to start by uh, thanking you for coming and also thanking Ambassador Bodin for bringing you uh, as part of this program. You mentioned standing on the shoulders of Frank Kameny and I think, you know, speaking as an openly gay man, I hope to stand on your shoulders one day uh, and having some of the director of OPM and the federal government be openly gay and talk about it in this type of venue is really, really powerful, um, I think for me and my peers. So that's, thank you. Uh, my question has nothing to do with that whatsoever. <laughs> I actually have a question about data. So we, uh, in the graduate program at least, the curriculum emphasizes the important of, importance of data analysis and I think 
Uh, especially right now, this is something the public sector is really embracing. So I was wondering if you had any examples uh, of how OPM is using data to maybe make the uh, PMF application a little bit more robust um, or anything else that you've seen from your perch as the director? Well, it's a, it's a great question. Um, data is incredibly critical because it, it informs, you know, good judgment will have good, you, you know, you can make the better data you've got and the better analysis tools and team you've got working on it, the better judgments you can make. Um, all of the healthcare discussion that I was giving you um, is an outgrowth of people who have not only an incredible grasp of manipulating the data and the cost materials and the profiles and everything, but an understanding of the policy impacts and, and a curiosity and inventiveness to try to play with it in such a way that you could bend the cost curve in the right direction rather than just watch it passively go up. Um, I believe that uh, you know learning those skills. In other words, you don't have to rely on the invisible hand of the market, uh, because uh, as uh, time shows, that hand often needs uh, some guidance. Um, and uh, you know, so it's it's an incredibly important skill. Uh, I have two gentlemen uh, that uh, I went to graduate school with uh, at Syracuse uh, at the Maxwell School and uh, John O'Brien and John Foley and <clears throat> and we all shared we lived in a house together you can imagine we call John there and uh, you know we'd say yeah sure <laughs> all three of us are but um, uh, you know they spent 25 years they specialized specifically in healthcare policy and in this uh, you know in, in that was their driving thing and they worked at the state level one worked in New Zealand on their program and they've, they've worked uh, all around the country on this and developed this great wellspring of information, but it's all been data driven. And when I got this job, it was in the back of my mind, I told them, I said, you know, look, I'm not sure where or how or when, but, you know, healthcare is going to be a big piece of the debate of this first term of this administration. And I think we're going to end up playing a pretty big role in it. And I don't know anything about it. And, you know, I know it's a lot to ask you guys to like, you know, you've got families, you know, to quit your jobs and take a political job with this administration to come on and, and do this. But God bless them, they both did. And they're working with a lot, of, they're on the political side, but we have a staff of career experts that are the ones manipulating that data. And, you know, 30% of our cost of health care is drugs, pharmaceuticals. The bulk of that cost reduction came in tracking that, proving it with the data, and then showing and working with our carriers of how we could achieve great savings in that area. Um, you, you know, so it's, it's essential in almost everything we do. Um, the PMF program, uh, there's a young man named Matt Collier, Barbara got to meet him, and he's, he's I, a young kid who I was at an event like this, and he, I said kid, he's a young man, who came up to me at one of these events like this and you know was wagging his finger at me like, you know, you need to fix this PMF program. I just had the most worst experience, blah, blah, blah. And he was like, you know, one of these poking in the chest, you know. And so I was like, well, how about you fixing this program? And uh, he said, well, I'm still in school. And I said, well, when you graduate, he says, you know, six, six weeks. I says, I can wait six weeks. <laughs> and so we hired him and uh, he, he is, the driving force behind the the pathways program, and he's the one who is is working on this on the on the PMF thing on scrapping the assessment on on putting back the interview so using more time tested ways to judge people um, and looking at the data and so I would welcome if any of you want to work on a project where this is still very much a work in progress and you know he's one guy. And we're pretty short staffed, and so if somebody wants to help on that as a school project, I know you know we'd love we and we'd welcome uh, the input. So uh, so think about it, uh, and and we'd we'd welcome to make it better because who's going to know better the application process than you who've just recently gone through it? Yes, hi. Hi, uh, Thomas Nelson, class of uh, 2004, MPA. Um, Currently, I'm a county executive in a medium to large size county in Wisconsin. Um, and as you know, Wisconsin was one of, one of a couple of uh, 
uh, states for which uh, the governor took a heavy hand toward the public employees. And being the chief executive for a workforce of 1,200, public employees span everything from people working at the airport, to health human services, uh, road construction, sheriffs, and so forth. From my perspective, um, I see morale as being very low. I want to know from your perspective if you think that this uh, current environment um, is, is an aberration or if it's a trend of things to come, and if so, what kinds of things that we can do to counteract that? Um, it is, I would argue, uh, it, you know, it's a multi-year trend. It's not just the recent battle of, you know, uh, of Wisconsin. Um, and I would argue that both parties are equally guilty of using public employees as a political football. Uh, Republicans do it, Democrats do it too. Uh, Jimmy Carter was just as bad at it as Ronald Reagan was. Um, I think uh, it, it's kind of an aberration and it plays on a deep-rooted thing in American history that there's always been sort of an anti-government feeling. So you can, it's easy to strum that chord. And uh, uh, it's kind of sad that uh, an executive or a member of a, you know, the leadership, you, in the private sector, you can't imagine a CEO of a company who would turn around and trash their employees. Um, you know, they'd be a pretty short-lived CEO. And yet, sadly, uh, that can happen in the, in the public sector. Um, I think uh, it, there's no question but that over time it wears on morale. Um, we are fortunate in the federal family that the people who have got into service and are staying in service really did it from a deep-seated motivation to do good for their neighbor. And that passion is holding despite what they see as the, you know, the storms that brew. Uh, I know that because we do uh, employee surveys each year. And we just uh, it did the employee survey. And for three questions, um, is your work meaningful? 97% response rate. Um, you know, are you able to have a positive impact in your job? 92% response rate. Would you recommend your job to someone else? 94% response rate. So, you know, it, you know, questions that go to sort of that morale issue show that they're not letting the, you know, the small-mindedness of a few overwhelm the good hearts of the many. And, uh, you know, I think it's, it's a good thing. The other thing you ask about sort of what do we best do about it, um, I, I will give you this example. It's interesting. If you ask Americans, you know, in surveys, <clears throat> what do you think of phone employees? You know, you will get a response, something along the lines of, they are a tick on the body politic, and they should be squashed like a bug, and they are gray and pasty faced pencil pushers. You know, want to steal my money. <laughs> Am I close? <laughs> um, you know, without the expletives. Um, if you ask the same people, what do you think of park rangers? Oh my God, I love park rangers. Uh, my kid is slow. I mean, he is just downright thick. And... This park ranger like spent time with him and actually explained the history of this site to him. And he came away and he 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 taught me about Gettysburg. He says, you know, I have been able to teach him like how to close the cereal box. And he's like teaching me, you know, this park ranger got through. You know, he's a D student. How you know park rangers are great. What do you think of Secret Service? Oh my god. <laughs> you know. First African American president, and he's still walking. <laughs> They're doing a damn good job. No one ever thanks Mark Sullivan, the director. By God, when he is, he's under a lot of stress, let me tell you. 
It's not an easy job. But Americans know that. And so when you break it to the individual, the polling results are highest trust, highest quality, highest integrity federal employees in those individual categories. Generally, you know, you have to, so it's this, it's, all, it's a schizophrenic reaction. And so my counsel is, is the best way to respond to that is know that and, and go to the specific. When you're talking about public servants, don't talk about federal employees or public servants. Talk about teachers, firefighters, you know, police. You, you know, you, we talk about Secret Service agents, park rangers, you, you know, CIA agents. I like to point out, you know, there was someone in HR that it wasn't just the SEALs who got Osama bin Laden. Someone in HR, you know, who helped hire the right person, who figured out the right analysis, who was doing that at their desk for a long time and tracked the house, allowed the SEALs to show up and carry out the mission. And so, there, you know, if any one of those team members had fallen, the whole thing falls. And so we, we've got to be smarter in how we make the argument. And that's, that would be my counsel, is I think going to the specifics, it, you'll get a much different reaction. OK? Yes? Uh, hi, Mr. Ray. My name is Christian Fong. And, uh, uh, my name is Christian Fong. I'm a sophomore in the Department of Operations, Research, and Financial Engineering. And as you might know, last year, the Woodrow Wilson School uh, ran into some troubles over its graduates choosing careers in finance or financial services and management consulting over careers in public service. So you, I think, talked fairly extensively about opening doors for college graduates to enter the federal service, but do you have any sort of positive plans to go out there and try and get the top students who study these programs? Well, you know, my hope is, I mean, the good news is, is we're getting a, a lot of good responses. Um, for the PMF program, we had over 10,000 applications this year for you know 900 slots. Um, so uh, you know there's there's there is a good demand that we are tapping into, but you, you know you got to do it's 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 like the old shoe leather campaigns. You got to do it one at a time. So <clears throat> a number of us, wherever anybody in the administration, excuse me. Wherever any of us go, we always try to meet with, um, you know, a school where we're where we're in that area, and talk to students directly. So whether cabinet secretaries who are out, the president does it when he's on the road, you know, trying to outreach to people and and, and you know engage them to think about careers in the federal service, um, and and that is showing some impact, um, and and we're getting more applications from a broader reach of schools now than we used to in the past. Um, but it's one, you know, that you got to do every year. One of the programs I've been talking about is asking our senior executives to get involved with, have each one of them take on two schools. Be willing to adopt your alumni, you know, where you went to school, go back, and pick one up. And go back and meet the deans and meet the, the staff who are there from year to year and develop that relationship so that they know who to call when they've got a superstar or somebody that they're having trouble getting placed. And, you know, be, be accessible, you know, answer questions, meet with the students, um, you know, help them understand what civil service is about and what you can do with a career in the federal government. And, you know, if, if I think if, if we can mobilize that army, if you will, we could then touch a lot more schools. And so we're at work at trying to do that right now. And we're open to a lot of other ideas. The other thing we're talking about is, you know, generational connectivity. So we're asking the PMF class from last year to do the exact same thing. Pick two schools, go back to your own school and go to one other and do what I'm doing. Make the pitch, answer questions, help people figure out how to go through the process, et cetera, et cetera, so that we can, you know, because that way people will have a, hopefully a higher trust factor uh, with who's carrying the message. So we're looking at it from a couple different ways, but you're exactly right. We just, you, you know, you can't, it's never done. You just got to keep trying to make it better. Okay. Yes, sir. Hello, I'm Michael Morandi, Michael Morandi uh, MPA 1983. Uh, thank you very much for a very passionate speech. Um, 
you're probably the largest employer, certainly the, the, the on the person, planet. The person, who, <laughs> the person who has to deal with Obamacare uh, to the greatest extent anybody in this country. Um, many of us are confused by what Obamacare is and so on and so forth. Although I thought you did an excellent job of um, bringing to the fore some of the highlights. Can you, as the person who has to implement that, can you tell us what the pluses and minuses are that you see and why it seems to be such a political, you know, hotbed? Yeah, I think, um, uh, you know, I think it's, uh, the person who I would give the most credit to in this is Secretary Sebelius. I mean, she's obviously the point and the leader on the implementation of the Affordable Care Act. Um, we have a big, we have helped as that is are, are one of the big players in it, but, but Secretary Sebelius at HHS is, is clearly our leader. Um, I think, you know, it, it all comes down to if, if you really, if you strip away the, you know, the heated rhetoric, um, the only thing people have a problem with is the mandate. There is literally nothing else in the bill that once, if you, if, you're, if you take the mandate out of that equation, every other argument just dies. Because, you know, when you start going to the individual specifics of it, you know, do you want to roll back the, the health care for 26-year-olds? Well, no, I like that piece. Do you want to take away the pre-existing coverage? You know, well, no, I like that piece. Um, to, you know, and, and so you start going through the specifics of it, and people are like, well, no, that, that piece is, uh, uh, no, don't take that away. Don't take that away. The, you, you get that reaction as you go through every specific until you get to the mandate. And the mandate, you know, there are people who are a lot smarter about health care than me. Um, but the mandate was one that the insurance industry said, without it, it can't work. Um, you, you know, because you'll have, you'll have the free rider problem that we face now. We have national health care now. It's called the emergency room. And it's very expensive. And anybody who, who gets sick, and if they don't have a health plan, that's where they end up. And we can't afford that, is the simple reality looking down the road. And so working with the insurance industry, it was, well, the only way you can do this to avoid that free rider problem is to make sure everybody kicks in. And, you know, and for those who are at so poor that they can't afford to even cover that, we have to subsidize. But it'll be cheaper to subsidize that person so that they can have a health care plan, so they can go see a regular primary care physician rather than the emergency room. So that was the whole logic behind the mandate, you know, the mandatory payment. But that's what sticks in everybody's craw, like the feeling of like, oh, I'm being told I have to pay for something that, you know, I should decide that. Well, in reality, you know, you're pretending that it's, a free, it's free to you now because if you're not paying for it and you don't have health care, we're all in this room paying for it because who pays for the emergency room visit? Us. So, uh, you know, I, I think at the end of the day, um, uh, you know, my hope is as people see this, and it's a market-driven solution. It's, you know, it is not a government plan. I'm not providing, you know, OPM is not writing the insurance plan. I provide a competitive field that private sector carriers come in and bid on. And then we put, we pick the best bidders and then give those to the public to choose from. And so, you know, it's a market driven solution. It's interesting, the OPM piece of it, our piece of it, it the reason we got it was because, you know, when they hit that log jam in the, in the Congress, people said like, well, why don't we just, you know, OPM does this, why don't we do it their way? And the Republicans in the room said, well, I can live with that. The Democrats said, well, we can live with that. And so, boom, we got it. Um, and the reality is, no one's complaining about our pre existing condition plan in those 24 states. And there's not a private sector carrier that is complaining about my overhead rate of 0.08%. Uh, 
Um, you, you know, my overhead rate for the nine million person plan that I'm running is 0.08 percent. So most private sector companies are saying, you know, you know keep doing it. Um, because at the end of the day, that enables them to sell their product and provide good efficiency in the marketplace and drive the, a good service. So my hope is, is when people actually, I, I hope, you know, uh, as people look at this and they start to go through the pieces of it, um, they'll strip away the rhetoric and look at the substance and, and end up liking what they see. So that's a, a simple explanation of a complicated issue. As best I can. Um, I'd like to take the privilege of the of the chair and ask a question, if I might. Last question. Um, last question. Okay, it falls it falls a little on, on what one of the, the students brought up, and, and you touched upon it in, in your early remarks. Is is not so much the generating the interest in public service, and and it may be because we're sitting in this school, but one thing that I've certainly seen in the five years I've been here is that there is tremendous desire to work in the government and the full range of issues that you're talking about. Um, but the, 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 the pathways in, and I chose that word very specifically, the pathways in are still very difficult. Um, and you talked a little bit about the pathways program and I'm a huge fan of it, but I would like a little bit more information on where it is in the process. You, you were using the present tense for it, and my sense is that it's still more prospective. Yeah. And you also said 10,000 people applied for PMF and 900 were selected. Um, you know, even even for, for students here who have gone through unbelievable odds to get into this university, those are daunting odds. Mm -hmm. What kind of numbers do you see attached to either the conversion intern program or the recent graduate program? Because that's gonna make a big difference. Well, we have, let me answer it, I'll, I'll go in reverse if I yeah. can. Um, well, no, I, I'll, I'll take it in order. Um, the public comp, we've issued, we posted draft regulations right. that were out for public comment until October 4th. Mm -hmm. And public comment closed October 4th, and we got a lot of comments. Um, so now we are required under federal rules to go through each and every one of those comments and, and consider them appropriately um, and then adjust the regulations as necessary uh, before we issue, you know, the final regulations. Mm -hmm. So we are in the process of doing that um, and we are driving to try to get to that final state by the end of the year. Um, and once we get them issued, then the new program can be stood up and operational. During the interim though, don't think like there's no opportunity. We, there, there are still intern, uh, the, the existing authorities, what we've told people to do um, is to use the SCEP authority mm -hmm. so that as you hire somebody, their hours count towards conversion. Okay. And so during this interim period, agencies can still bring you on as an intern or as uh, the recent grad rules, it wouldn't be as easy, but because that, that program doesn't exist right now. Mm -hmm. But as an intern, you can come into the federal government while we're get, getting these regulations stood up. So that's the timeline we're hoping. So my hope is by the spring season, we'll be able to, to do this. And we're discussing how do we best protect the rights of people who are kind of caught in the middle period, you know. Mm -hmm. And so we're looking at that. And that was an area where we got a lot of comments on. So we'll be, we'll be dealing with that in the final regs. Um, the other, uh, issue is in terms of numbers that we expect. When I got into this job, there was about 500 PMFs uh, that agencies hired. And the credibility of the program was bad. And so first we had to sort of reestablish our credibility. And then once we were able to do that, we had to reconvince agencies to go out and hire kids, you know, bring them in. Uh, because at the end of the day, the agency's underwriter pay for this position. And so they don't have unlimited budgetary resources. They, you know, have to, it's driven by their budget. Um, we have grown it from that 500 up to the 900. And my goal is, is what I have talked to the agencies and what I've asked is, is look, 
once we get the, you know, the new rules in place and we get good quality students and the trust is rebuilt in this and we get the 900 hired, the next year we'll make, you know, I've argued of doubling, play, let's play a game of double. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if we can get 900 hired, the next year let's open up and try to get slots for 1,800. And if we get 1,800 hired, let's see if we can move it to 3,600. So I, I'm sort of looking at this as a, as a, a position where we can, we can hopefully, as we build the credibility as we go along, increase the number. Now there is some break point, I don't know where it is, so I don't want to say there's some hard and fast ceiling, or, or, or you know, we're nowhere near it yet. Mm -hmm. um, you know, to give you a sense of scale, if you were talking about as, as the, the largest employer, just natural turnover, even if we hired and created no new positions, um, natural turnover is between 10 and 20,000 people a year. So you have, you know, those just filling the, the positions that people retire or die or, you know, something happens um, or quit, move on to another opportunity. Backfilling those positions create, you know, that many opportunities on an annual basis. So, so there's always an opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, it, you know, so I think, you know, hopefully working within this. And then there's some areas that obviously are experiencing growth while others are cutting back. You know, Homeland Security continues to grow. Uh, you know, so there's more opportunities in those areas. And there's more, you know, mm -hmm. so you, you look where the, the current issues and needs are. Okay. Right? And that's going to be a, very, a great deal of interest to a lot of people. Well, thank you all very much. I appreciate your patience. And